Hello PennDOT Community Traffic Safety Partners. Thank you for joining us for another video which is being produced for you by the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Center for Injury Research and Prevention. In this video, Chapter 12a, we'll get started by talking about quantitative data collection for program evaluation and begin by talking about surveys, which are arguably the most commonly used form of quantitative data collection available for program evaluation. We'll talk about the values and benefits of surveys, as well as some of the limitations for surveys for program evaluation when they're not done well. We'll discuss the difference between pre and post program evaluation surveys, the top tips for developing successful surveys, and examples for the types of questions that you might want to ask in your own program evaluation surveys. There are a number of values and benefits for using surveys for program evaluation. First, Surveys are very quick and inexpensive. You can even bring them with you to your program so that you can quickly get information right on site from participants. They're also usually easy to prepare. And in a formative program evaluation, you might be looking to develop the overall process of how the program is coming together, particularly if you're establishing a new program for the first time. The contacts that you make in the information gathering phase and process of this can help to legitimize your interventions for later implementation and also give you ideas of the types of questions that you might want to ask as you go forward. But if surveys aren't done well, then sometimes they can interfere with the kind of program evaluation that we would want to have. We need to remember that when we use surveys for program evaluation, we have to be careful to survey as many people from our target audience as possible, rather than just survey subsets of our target audience. Sometimes the information from convenience studies can be biased because it only surveys a subset of the people that we served. Second, when you're developing your surveys for program evaluation, make sure that you deliver those surveys to the people who participated in your program and not just the people who delivered your program because the providers of the services or programs that you're offering might have very different feedback than the people who took your program. And lastly, remember that the number of informants that you survey might be too small to generalize to your total community if you're only asking one small subset of the population that you serve. So whenever possible, ask as many people as you can who have participated in your program. Two commonly used survey approaches include pre and post surveys and automatic system response surveys. Pre and post surveys happen at the beginning and end of your program. Automatic response systems get used during your program delivery. We'll talk in this chapter about pre and post surveys. And in the next video, chapter 12b, we'll talk about the automatic response system surveys and how they can be helpful for your program evaluations as you're going through your programs. Pre and post surveys should be developed to measure the same key constructs before and after implementation. Both pre- and post-surveys can include questions about demographics, driving behaviors, driving experiences, knowledge about driving laws, etc. But the main difference between pre- and post-surveys is what happens at the end of your survey. So while the core questions should be the same on your pre-survey and your post-survey, post-surveys can also include questions at the end to assess overall program satisfaction and engagement. When developing surveys, there are best practice tips which we think are going to be important for you to consider to develop successful surveys. Let's talk about these now. Language use. Anytime you develop a survey, your language should be very simple and written to as low a literacy rate as possible. The simpler we keep our language and the lower the literacy level of our language in a survey, the less likely it is that people will be confused by our questions and will think that we're asking them something different than we actually are. One way to do this is to avoid words in your surveys that are more than two syllables whenever possible. Also avoid using jargon or terms that aren't universal. Close-ended questions or fixed response questions can help to ensure that your respondents are going to interpret questions the same way and really make for a simplified analysis later on. But open-ended questions, which allow people to write in their own responses, they're also time-consuming to ask and require a lot of work to analyze. So whenever possible, keep your surveys as close-ended as you can. Question wording. Avoid using what are called double-barreled questions. Double-barreled questions are questions that ask two things in the same question. 
For example, say you wanted to know about how much your program had helped students to improve their overall confidence and their skills related to highway driving. What you wouldn't want to do would be to ask a question like, how much did this program help you improve your confidence and skills related to highway driving? And the reason why you wouldn't want to ask that is because you're asking about two different things. Maybe your program was really successful in helping them to increase their confidence, but maybe it was less successful in helping them to increase their skills. By asking these questions in the same question item, you might not only confuse your participants, but you might be missing out on some possibly really important data which can help you to inform your program going forward. So instead, you would want to split this up into two questions. You should also avoid using double negatives or questions which have the word not in them. For example, you should not use the best online survey software available. When you read that, doesn't it make you do a double take? It's rather confusing because of course somebody would be thinking, wait, wouldn't I want to use the best online survey software available? Yes, they would. But by asking double negative questions, it can be very confusing for the respondent filling out your survey. So you want to avoid that whenever possible. Avoid too many questions that are simply agree, disagree. It's okay to have some of them, but the reason why we don't want our survey to be filled with all of them is because people are biased to agree. Be clear with any terms and definitions that you use. If you're going to use a term that perhaps was frequently cited in your program but isn't universally known, remind people about what that term means right in the survey. And if you're going to use a rating scale, make sure you label clearly and also consistently. So if you start out with your first 10 questions on a scale of strongly disagree to strongly agree, then you'll want to make sure that your next set of rating scale questions are also strongly disagree to strongly agree. When possible, use between five and seven fixed points and allow for a middle category or a neutral category in case somebody doesn't have an agreement or a disagreement with your scale. Question ordering. Demographics, whenever possible, should be at the end of your survey. And this is primarily because we want to start with the most important information. This can also help people who get what's called information or question fatigue. Also, organize your questions by block and theme. So, for example, all of your questions about seatbelt use would be together. All of your questions about driving policies would be together. And the order of questions can also sometimes affect the answers. So if it's possible and you're doing an online survey, randomize your questions. This is possible when you use internet surveys. Tools like SurveyMonkey allow you to determine whether or not you want to have the questions asked in a fixed order or randomized. Types of questions you could include. Now this is one example of the types of questions you could include related to distracted driving. And you've seen this in one of our earlier chapters. But please go to the resource book because we have provided you with a number of examples for the types of questions that you could include. For example, questions about self-efficacy, attitudes, behaviors, and behavioral intentions toward distracted driving, as well as demographic questions. Also, see the resource book for an example of a pre and post program survey which you can adapt and modify. Here we have an example for you of questions on a rating scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree, as well as simple agree and disagree questions. And lastly, if you're doing a post survey, don't forget to include those surveys about program feedback. So for example, what did you like most about the teen driving competition? How could the teen driving competition be improved to have a greater impact? How would you compare this event with other highway traffic safety events you have experienced? Again, see the resource book for an example of a pre and post program survey, which you can adapt and modify. You have just completed Chapter 12a, Quantitative Data Collection, where we focused on survey development and questions. In Chapter 12b, we'll focus on the how-to of quantitative data collections. We'll talk about methods for improving your delivery, as well as using automatic response systems, and how to get started with your analysis and reporting if you choose to do quantitative data collection for your program evaluations. Thank you so much for watching.